So how, how's everyone feeling this morning? Good. Yeah, fine. Great. It's a trick question, isn't it? Yeah, it's so much fun. Yeah, so we're in week three of a five-week sermon series where we're talking about our feelings. I know a lot of you are really excited about that. Okay, uh, okay, maybe not a lot of people, but I, I have heard from quite a few how this series is really connecting to where you're at right now in whatever season of life it is that you're in. And some of that feedback is actually coming from those at home. And uh, we want to thank you for the feedback, whether it's from home or in person here. It, it, it's always helpful. But, but we are in this series where we're talking about our feelings and how our feelings are like a vehicle that moves us from where we are to some destination. Okay, some de- just because that's what feelings and emotions do. They, they move us, okay? And we've also been saying is, is that the question is not whether or not those feelings are right or whether they're wrong, but that we just acknowledge that they're real, that that they're feelings, because we're human, okay? But then what we might ask, the important question then, is about our feelings, is that, and that question is, is that, so where are those feelings going to take us? And we've talked about, we've talked about visualizing ourselves at a, like, like we're at a T in the road, and there's a sign in front of us that says you can go to this place, the, the, the place that your feelings want to take you, or you can go and, and let Jesus in your vehicle, like in the driver's seat, okay, and let Jesus drive you to the place he would have you go according to the will of God. And so that's what we've been talking about, and that's kind of the process that we're trying to lay down as a foundation for ourselves as Christ followers, that we want to invite Jesus into the vehicle of our feelings and let him take over as the driver of our vehicle, the the vehicle of our feelings, whatever those feelings may be. Now, this week's topic, or this week's feeling, okay, that we're going to discuss is the feeling of sadness, okay, where we ask the question, you know, got sadness, okay? I mean, anyone driving around in the vehicle of sadness, yeah, like I expected anybody to raise their hand. You're not going to do it, right? Like, so so I, I don't know about all you, but thinking of vehicles that I've driven around in, I can think of quite a few that were sad. Okay, I mean, like, for instance, the first car I bought was a Plymouth Duster. Okay, 16 years old, good-paying part-time job. I bought it from my parents, but it was this sandy cream color, you know, and, and it was just a plain-looking automatic six-cylinder Plymouth Duster, right? You, anybody remember the Dusters? Yeah, it wasn't, uh, so, I mean, but... You know, uh, I bought it from my parents. Uh, you know, it was mine to do what it, So I had it painted lime green, which is kind of like a really bright, uh, I mean, it was called Go Green, okay? So it became this Go Green duster, and I put some of those uh, tires on with the white letters on, you know, sporty tires that if you have a sports car. So, I, you know, I tried to make it look, but it's still just, it was just a bright green duster, okay? Not the kind of car you're, you know, some teenager's going to get real excited about. Not the car of my dream, certainly, you know? And, and so, but this car, you know, uh, it was kind of sad, okay? But it was mine. And, and, uh, and so, but anyway, I only had it a short period of time, and, and I saved up enough money to put a down payment on uh, the car that I bought that ended up being the saddest car I ever owned, okay? Which just so happened to be one of the only two brand new cars that I've ever owned in my entire life, the other being a Chevy Cavalier, and I'm not sure that counts, okay? So, so the, like, this car is really the only one, okay? But it was the saddest car I ever drove, mind you. It was a brand new 19. 19- 1976 Chevy Nova, okay, black with white interior, 350 V8, four barrel exhaust, standard shift. I could lay rubber in all four years. Now imagine, imagine being a senior in high school and driving a ride like that every day to school. Uh, you stop by, pick up the ladies on the way. I mean, is that sad? No, that's good. That's good. You know. Well, let me tell you why it is sad. Why it was sad. That's because I only had that car for six months. <laughs> You guessed it. Six months later, after I lost my license for speeding, okay, I had to sell that car, okay, because the insurance was way more than the car was, okay? I was on high-risk insurance, so, and, you know, so all I could afford, you know, I had to get rid of it, okay? And then, t- because insurance was, I had to buy this 1951 Ford Falcon for 50 bucks, now, what kind of car do you get for 50 bucks, okay? And what well, you may ask, okay, well, it didn't have AC, 
But it did have these cool cranked down windows that you could put the window down, you know. And it had no defrost to defrost the windows. But it did come with a scraper so you could reach out the open window and scrape it off as you drove along. And it had bald tires, you know. But fortunately, there was a gas station just down the road. And I could stop every other day and put air in the tires. And I drove that car for six months, okay. Oh, I forgot to tell you, it was freshly painted, cool, this cool color blue which had been painted on with a paintbrush. <laughs> and you could see the brush stroke. So, are you, yeah, yeah. Now, you might say, oh, come on, Mark. That's got to be the saddest car that you ever drove. But no, the saddest was that brand new 1976 Chevy Nova with the 350 V8 peel rubber and all four gears. That was the saddest car ever. And sadness, you know, it's an emotion. And if you're, you're going to talk about this, and we're going to talk about this today, we're all good. But sadness is one of those emotions. Well, it's not just the wrong or right, you know, there's no right or wrong. It's that we need to acknowledge that being sad, it's real, okay? And so here's the thing, you know, we've been talking about our emotions, our feelings, and, and what we've been saying is, is it's not whether they're right or wrong. It's that the question we need to ask is where, where our feelings are just basically, I mean, they're human, right? But the question is, where were those emotions or feelings taking? Where are they taking us, okay? So we've had this visual of a road sign. By the way, mine took me to sadness, okay? I mean, it made me, um, anyway, we'll get into that. So we've kind of had this visual road sign where we've talked about, right, where you just stop and you say, hey, sadness isn't bad, right? It's not good. It's not bad. It's just real. But the question is, where is sadness going to take me? Okay, and I can tell you with that Chevy Nova experience where I had to give up my car of my dreams, I can tell you that as soon as that car was gone, I was sad. I was sad. And so here's where it took me. It took me to a place of frustration and bitterness. I mean, frustration and bitterness is a place where you just, you just start spouting out real loud, irrational things, right? I mean, like, like why? <laughs> why would they even suspend me for going fast? Like, I mean, you've got to be a good driver to go that fast, right? Why? It makes no sense. And why would God let this car, well, have, why would he let me have it and then take it away? And it's not right that insurance companies treat young people so unfairly. I mean, come on, what's the deal with that, okay? And listen, I, don't tell me to relax that God still loves me, because listen, I'm I'm kind of bitter about this. I'm kind of frustrated. And every night as I drove home from work in that 1951 Ford Falcon, which just, by the way, this happened in the wintertime. So like January, it's freezing cold in Pennsylvania, and the driver's side windows rolled down. Yeah, rolled down, going home. And I'm scraping both the inside and the outside of the window all the way, the whole seven miles home. And let me tell you what I was thinking, because I, I was not thinking, oh, yeah, I bet one day I'll be a preacher, and this will make a really good illustration. I was not thinking that. Okay, I, no, I was thinking, I'm never, here's what I was thinking. I'm never going to be able to drive a car like that 1976 Chevy Nova with the 358 lay rubber and all four gears ever again. And listen, none of those girls from before, they weren't, they weren't interested in riding that 1951 Ford Falcon. I mean, they just weren't. I mean, I mean, that's the place, I mean, that's a place of feeling sadness, right? It took me, and it made me frustrated, bitter. Boy, I'm sure glad I got that off my chest. I didn't realize, like, I've been carrying that around all these years, you know, but, but yeah, it does. So, we've been talking about our feelings, like, this, this last week, we talked about anxiety and stress, and this week, we're going to talk about sadness, and I shared that time of sadness from my younger years, uh, and I tried to think of something more recent that made me sad, and at first I couldn't come up with much, okay, except the experience that we all experienced in our family when our son-in-law, Jack, became severely ill and died of cancer, and there was a lot of sadness then, okay, a lot, a lot of joy too, but there was a lot of sadness, but other than that, sadness, when I think of sadness as an emotion, and I think in terms of today, like today's reality, I think a lot of folks' realities is in terms of sadness, it could be defined, and if you're a note taker, you can write this down, it could be defined as, I had something great, and I lost it, and I'm not sure it's ever coming back. And honestly, I think there's a lot of people, listen now, think about this, I think there's a lot of people in our country that are pondering that right now, okay? They're pondering, will it? Will the way things used to be in my country, in my town, in my job, in my church, among my family and friends, will it ever be that good again? 
And here's the thing about sadness, at least for people like me. I mean, as I thought about this topic of sadness, I think for a lot of people, and it could be men more than women, maybe, I don't know. But when I first started to think about sadness, for instance, if you were to come to me and ask me, Mark, do you struggle with sadness? Is like sadness a thing for you? I quickly would have replied, no. No, I don't know that I struggle with sadness much, and still having thought about it more, I don't know that it's a thing, okay, I don't, and, and, and that I just don't know that I would call it that, okay, but if we're going to be real, if we're going to be real with one another in here, and, and having thought about it some more now, are there days when I just don't feel great? Are there days when I just don't like where I'm at right now? I mean, are there days when some kind of emotion or feeling is trying to take me over and it's hard to tell what it is? I mean, if you were to ask in that moment, I might just say, you know what? I don't know that I'm sad, but I'm feeling something or the absence or something. And if you were to ask me why, the answer might be because I, I never thought I'd be here. I never thought I'd be here in this spot. I never thought I'd be here in this moment. Case in point, I kind of I made a list up, okay? And I used to drive, I told you, this Chevy Nova sports car that could peel out in all four gears. About five or six years later, I find myself driving my wife Marky's minivan around. Okay. <laughs> right? Okay. And, and I'm saying things like, hey, this, this is pretty roomy. This is pretty decent. It gets good gas mileage. I mean, this thing handles pretty good. That's sad. <laughs> right? That's sad. What's become of me? You know, here's another one. Because I used to, about that time, I used to eat pizza like any time I wanted, which was like any time a pizza commercial would come on TV and then some. Now the same pizza commercial comes on the TV and I have to look at the calendar to see how soon my next doctor's appointment is to see whether I can have it. You know, because, you know, just smelling one of those things costs you five pounds, right? And, and you, you don't get to determine where it goes, right? You don't like it. You can't direct the five pounds. It just does it, okay? So, Here's another. I never thought the day would come and I'd be wrestling on the floor with grandchildren and they'd say things like, hey, Pappy, you're squishy. <laughs> <laughs> That's sad. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, grandchildren. I no longer like you and I no longer like you. Okay. Now, we, okay, so we can have fun with the preacher, okay, you know, about those kind of sad moments. But as I thought through the sadness thing, I looked back, it took me a while, honestly did. I, I looked back and I recalled some not so fun sad moments, okay? Like, like as a, a young person growing up, I thought relationships always turned out like the Disney movies, you know? I mean, they live happily ever after, okay? Where love cures all and every story turns out with a happy ending and then mine didn't. And mine didn't. And I thought about a friendship, a good friendship of years. I had this friendship for years, and, and, and it went like that too. I, I know this person, we're tight, we're on the same page until the day I found out they betrayed. And now when I think about that friendship still, it, does, it doesn't leave me feeling good or great. You know, maybe I'm an idealistic person, I suppose, but I used to think about ministry, and I thought if you just poured your heart into a person, came alongside them, discipled them, befriended them, guided them, and then... You know, they, they would go the way, you know, teach them the way to go, and that's, that's how it would go, okay? And sometimes they do, and when it happens that way, it is good, and it is great. But if we're being honest, I mean, life is like the parable of the sower, okay? And there are those, try as you might, they fall by the wayside. And sometimes during the week, I'll come in here, and I'll see an empty seat where they used to sit, and I know it's going to be empty again this week, and I'm telling you what, that's some of the saddest sad I know. And I know some of you feel the same way. You know, two Sundays ago at response time, as we sang the song, It's Well With My Soul, someone came up to me after that service and said, Mark, there at the end, you seem sad. And I explained, well, I don't know that it was really me, but that song made me think about the man who wrote that song and all that he suffered when he, his family drowned in the sea. And it made me think about my loved ones that have passed on. And I know others in the room were doing the same because I was looking at you and you had tears coming out your eyes. And I don't know that I was sad, but I was feeling a sense of loss. Something good, it's gone. I think a lot of us think that way. And I don't know what I struggle, I don't know that I struggle with sadness per se. And, and, and I mean, would you, would you say you do? You know, struggle with sadness? But do you ever feel a sense of like, I had this thing that was good and now I've lost it and I don't know if it's ever coming back. So would you? Would you say, you know, I struggle with sadness? Would you say I struggle with loneliness? Would you say that I struggle with hopelessness? No, I don't think I, I'd say that. But if you caught me in an honest moment and you said, Mark, does the reality of what you've lost, does the reality of what, uh, who you've lost, does the reality of just how lonely you can feel sometimes and, and how sometimes you feel like things are never going to change? Yeah. 
I can do that. And I think God would lean in in that moment, and we're going to talk about this today, but I think he, he would lean in and he'd say, okay, let's be honest, Mark. That's called sadness. It's the feeling that you had something good, and now you lost it, and you don't know if you'll ever get it back. You don't think you will. Okay, and some of you have been in that same place, that same vehicle, the vehicle sadness, because some of you used to have great friends, okay, close relationships with loved ones or parents or grandparents and the like, and and I mean, there are some of you in this room, you would say, you know what, I used to have a great family, okay, and you did, you had a great family and a great relationship with your parents and with your kids and your siblings, now fast forward and the reality is it's gone, it's gone. It just kind of blew up or it blew away, okay? And, and it's, a place, it's, it's a place that can turn bitter. It's a place of bitterness or it's a place of hopelessness and loneliness, even in your family. I mean, for lots of reasons that can happen, and you've had to watch them become who they've become. You didn't like it, but you had to watch it, and you've had to watch them depart in a very sad way. And the message of the church today is you just need to know it's okay to be sad about that. In fact, the reality is that you had it, you know, I mean, you had it in your grasp, and it was great, okay? I mean, maybe it was the ideal of marriage, maybe it was the ideal of parenting, it was friendships that were really rich, a job that you just dreamed of, and you had it. It was incredibly good, in fact, it was amazing, and now it's gone, and it's just gone, and and you're not sure you're going to get it back, and I mean, probably not. It's not going to work out the way you thought. That's what you're thinking. And here's the thing, church family. I I don't care who you are, okay? And I know we all process process things differently, but a basic human emotion that God gave us all in moments of loss is just plain old sadness. It's real. It's real. So how's everyone feeling today? Aren't you glad you got up and came to church, huh? Yeah, yeah, I, I know. <laughs> Let me tell you something. I, I'm so stoic. Until I got done writing all that stuff, I was exhausted. I mean, uh, talking about my feelings exhausted me. And listen, we're, we're looking at David in this series, and perhaps there's no one more human and more aware of his emotions than King David, and who, who wasn't king at the time. But anyway, who, by the way, the Bible describes as a man after God's heart, God's own heart, yeah. And we find that description in 1 Samuel 16, I believe, at a time when God's looking for somebody to lead his people. And he's looking for somebody that's going to reset things for his people. And so he wants to call somebody that holds in their heart this ability to feel, this ability to project what they feel, the person that's not going to stuff or stifle or hold back, but rather reflect and express the emotions of God. And so here's what happens. And I think this is generally true, unless you write songs or books or maybe keep a journal or something where you just or expressing your feelings all the time but for david david did what most of us i think do not do in that he tapped into his emotions and listen he wrote 73 of the 150 psalms meaning he was he's not one to hold back okay never was one to hold back so here here's the backstory on david and the moment at context okay the backstory the moment we're going to look at this week and we find it in first samuel 16 which by the way comes right after first samuel 15 where god is sorry that he ever made king saul king okay that's in 15 okay and so he's going to pick someone whose heart is like his and that he desires the things of god he wants to do the will of god and in chapter 16 samuel one of the greatest prophets of his time comes to this house the house of jesse who has a bunch of boys and he's come to anoint the next king and in front of every single one of the brothers this has got to be the younger brother's great dream right i mean just think about this He, Samuel, brings David in to talk to David in front of his older brothers how incredible David is. He's going to say, hey, David, you're incredible. In front of, it's got to be your dream, right, if you're the youngest, right, okay? And how about, you know, and he talks about how God sees you, and he's going to use you, and he has plans for you. And listen, he says, he's got a palace for you. He's got a kingship in your future, you know? And if you watch David's life early on, you'll say, everything supports that right like like right out of the gate he goes off and he kills a bear now some people do that okay but then he goes out and kills a lion not too many people do that then he goes out and kills a giant and through it all he becomes one of the best military leaders the nation of israel has ever seen and and as it would happen he also steps into one of the best friendships he'll ever have a guy named jonathan who just happens to be son of the king and then not only does he walk into that rich relationship but then the king says hey by the way let me give you my daughter's hand in marriage How's that for a blessed life? (laughs) Sounds good, right? I mean, like, you're the king's top military man, you're married to the king's daughter, and the king's son's your best friend. Okay, now, this is early on in David's life, when David's stock, so to speak, is on the rise, okay? Like, David's life is good, it's great. If it got any better, he'd be too, right? 
Yeah, so you know, then, then like in the stock market crash of 29, his stock came crashing down, and the king who once honored him, out of jealousy, out of own control, starts chucking spears at him, right? He's trying to kill David in this relationship that he never thought would end with Jonathan. It's completely cut off, literally, with the wife too. His wife, Michael, the king's daughter, was taken from him by the king and given to another man. So in Psalm 142, which is our text today, if you haven't turned to it already, in Psalm 142, David's on the run to save his very life. And in Psalm 142, he just has this very real and this very honest conversation in one of the lowest moments of his life, okay, which is spoken and literally written from a cave. In fact, in my Bible, uh, in the bold print, under the bold print where it says Psalm 142, there's a little line. It says David when he's in the cave. Did you say that? It says David when he's in the cave. Isn't that interesting? He's in the cave. I mean, when I'm feeling this way, where you want to retreat into a cave, I don't sit down, plug into my feelings, and write poetry. How about you? You do that? <laughs> I don't. No, no. I get a two liter of Mountain Dew, a bag of bar- barbecue potato chips, and I plug in a John Wayne video. That's what I do. Okay. And so, but here's David. He's right in the middle of this very good life where he has it all, and now it's gone. It's gone, okay? Now, don't miss the visual. Uh, don't miss the visual, real-life picture of sadness here because David had something good, and now it's gone, and there's just this great sense of loss and sadness, okay? And he's hiding down in the cave, okay? Let's not miss it, the visual, okay? Because for a lot of us, there's no better picture of the feeling of having it good and then losing all than retreating and hiding out in the cave. That's what a lot of people do, okay? Because if there's a place where the vehicle sadness will take you, it is the cave of sadness, right? And a lot of us have been there. A lot of us have been there. So, so like David, for most of us, we end up in this cave, but after a bit, the cave ends up being a cave of bitterness, right? A cave of bitterness. And, I, and listen to his language here. It's right here. He says in the Psalm, verses 1 and 2, Psalm 142, he says, I cry aloud to the Lord. I lift up my voice to the Lord for mercy. I pour out before him my what? My complaint, before him I tell all my troubles. And it sounds like cave, cave language, right? I mean, listen, listen to the language. Why, why, God, would you let this happen? Life was so good, but now it's not. Why would, you, why would you let that happen? What say you, church family, ever been in that cave? Ever been in that cave? Yeah. Why, God? Why would you let cancer in? Why would you let that happen? Why would you let me struggle for so long? Why would you take that relationship away from me? I mean... I thought you intended a life for me in the king's palace, right? And I thought with you, you know, my life would be about great relationships. And I thought with you, my path would be smooth sailing and life would be grand. But never once, never once, God, with you did I think I'd end up in a cave. So, yeah, that's part of the reason for my crying out. I came to you because I've got some complaints, God, because I'm not in a good place. I'm in the cave of bitterness, you know. Or maybe it leads to a cave of hopelessness because David's there too. Look at verse three. He said this. He said, my spirit grows faint within me. You see it? He's losing hope. David's overwhelmed. He's losing hope. His spirit's fading. Anybody else ever feel like that when you're in a cave? So that's David. Okay, so note takers, write this down. The language of the cave of sadness is bitterness and hopelessness. The language of the cave of sadness is bitterness and hopelessness and where you just say, I'm never going to get past this because this is never going to be over. I'll never get back to all that I had before. I'll never get back to the future that I once had. I'll just never, ne- I'm never going to be good again. Now, that cave can be a lonely place too, okay? And I don't know that we have this on the outline up there, but you can write it down. Uh, you, you might find yourself in the cave of loneliness. Ever feel like that? Nobody around. Okay, David certainly sounds like he feels all alone. Look at verse four. He says this. He just says, well, he says a number of things, but let's look at verse four. He says, look and see there is no one at my right hand. No one there. Okay, no one is concerned about me. I have no refuge. No one cares for my life. Right. And that's what the cave of sadness will speak to you, right? That there's nobody. There's no one. There's nobody that really understands what I'm going through. There's nobody that really cares about me. Nobody that understands how I'm lost. Nobody who would stick up for me. You know, nobody that would even notice that I'm having a bad, I'm in a bad place. No one's going to notice. And that's the cave of sadness. That's what it will speak to you. That's what it will say to you. It speaks bitterness. And it speaks hopelessness to you. And it will speak loneliness to you. Which kind of raises the question. So why would anyone ever want to go to the cave of sadness? Right? Any of you have a dog that you loved? Go ahead. Put him up there. It's all right. You're in church. Okay? 
Yeah, me too. I have one. Okay, a friend of mine once said to me, hey, you've got to watch this dog movie called Hachi, A Dog's Tail. You know this one? It's like the true life story took place in Japan. Anybody ever seen it? Hachi, Hachi. yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. It's, he said, you got to watch it, Mark. It's a true story, and it's the greatest dog movie ever. So I did. I watched the movie. Listen, if you have a dog you love, don't ever watch that movie, okay, because it's like the saddest movie ever. So I called my friend and said to him, like, why would you do that? Why, that's the saddest movie ever. I mean, I mean, that was like 10 years ago. Brought it up this summer. Now, I didn't say this out loud, but I thought, my, get behind me, Satan. You know, <laughs> that movie is so sad you know we're supposed to be friends why would you tell me to watch that i mean why would anyone intentionally want to be sad go to a place where you know it's going to make you sad but some people do i mean some people most of us not you know but some people are like oh it was so good it was sad so sad they cry the whole, why why would you want to do that i mean i, I know that sounds i mean uh, most people try to avoid sad movies sad books and even sad people and i know sad you know the whole sad that sounds uncaring but it, subconsciously i think it's true i mean do you want to be around people that make you reflect on things like like that were good in your life you know but now they're not i mean probably not okay but anyway so we've talked about how the feeling of sadness can end up leading into a place of bitterness holiness and loneliness but how do we not do that how do we not go there how do we escape the cave of sadness i mean no one wants to live in the cave of sadness right anybody want to live in the cave of sadness that's what I thought. Okay, some people do, but I, I would hope not, okay? And while some folks try this, I mean, like, you just can't pretend it away, right? Like, like if you don't acknowledge it, like, it's not really happening, it's not going to go away, okay? It's not going to go away. No, sadness is real, and so we need to be honest about it and admit it. We're in this cave of sadness, but now what? Where do we go from here? Well, what's pretty clear about David, and this is so good, I think, because clearly David doesn't pretend he's not in the cave, and, it, he, and honestly, he's pretty clear that he doesn't want to stay in the cave. So what's he do? Well, he's like, this is like the tea in the road, right? And so where are you going to go, David? Which way are you going to turn here? Well, check this out, because right there in the middle of one of David's darkest moments, by the way, did you ever notice it's dark in caves, right? It's dark in caves, okay? David, darkest moment of his life, perhaps, David gets down on his knees, and he recognizes something that you and I probably need to recognize. And I don't know when it hit him. I think he knew it all along, but he kind of had to remember it, okay? But at some point, he just recognized that God, God knows I'm in this cave. God's not surprised that I'm in this cave. And not only does he know I'm in this cave, but I, honestly, I'm not alone in this cave because he's here with me, right? I mean, it's like he lit this light in the midst of this dark cave, and suddenly light and hope came flooding in. And that light David lit was an awareness, listen to me now, that light was an awareness of God's presence, the presence of God, okay? I mean, like, he, he, he's, he's turning towards God, and he's opening the door and sliding over to let God in, right? That's what's going on here. Just hear his language. Verse 5, he says this. He says, Lord, I cry to you. Now, that's real. That's honest. I mean, I said this last week, but if you've never got down on your knees and just said what's real and honest, you're, you're missing out on some of the most spiritual prayers that there are. You know, that, that's where it happens, okay? And so, so David does it. He's real and honest, you know, and he's talking about what's been lost. He goes on. He cries, I cry out to you, Lord. You know, I'm turning to you. You're my refuge. It's like, if it's not you, then I don't know who, and I don't know of any other safe place to go in the land of the living right now. You're my only option because you're my portion. You're my portion because I have nothing left to, I have nothing left to give. And he goes on. But do you hear the emotion David's feeling here? These feelings of bitterness, these feelings of hopelessness, and, and they're getting too strong for him. Those feelings of loneliness. And David says, they're overwhelming me. And I don't know how to put him out of the cave anymore. So God, I've got to have you in this cave. And I know you haven't left me here alone, but here I am. You know, I need you here. You've been here all along, but I need you here. Listen, David says in verse seven, he says, set me free. <laughs> Set me free from this cave because, Lord, this is a prison right now that I can get. You set me free so that I can get back to praising your name. Then the righteous will gather around me because of your goodness to me. Listen, friends, do you hear? Do you hear hope? He's got hope there. He's got faith there, which is hope certain. He knows God can do it. In other words, David believes what he does not yet have in his hands. And that is the goodness he once had. That goodness that God had given to him is coming back. 
It's going to come back to him. Do you see it, friends? It's the good news we all hope for when, the feeling, when we're feeling it. But David found it when so many times we miss it, okay? You see, I think David found what so many of us miss, and that is, is that God's power and God's presence is never more available to us than when we're in a cave and we're honest and we're real about who we are and how we're feeling. Are you hearing me, church family? I just believe, I really do. Uh, looking back to some of the saddest moments in my life that I mentioned earlier, those K moments that I'd rather have avoided, looking back with David's eyes, I now recognize that God's presence was never more available than in those caves of sadness. That we might all see and have faith like David did. The, you know, there's always hope. There's always hope that goodness would return, will return and that it might, and once we understand that, it will shift our perspective. It will shift our perspective. We good? You hearing me? Okay. So, I'm about done with that. How's the story end? He turns, right? He says, God, I'm getting over. You get in, right? How's the story end? Well, long story short, because of our time getting short, but as the rest of the story goes, David didn't just find God's presence in the cave of sadness, but David also found other good relationships in the cave as well. Yeah, for David would spend roughly 10 years on the run from King Saul, who is constantly trying to kill him. And so David's story is not just a story of one cave, but it's a story of many caves as he went from cave to cave to cave. I mean, I mean, if anyone knew the nature caves, it's David, right? He, he understands caves. But perhaps some of you, you know caves too because you've been in every cave on your hillside. There might be someone here. But in that moment, while he battled feeling alone, here's the reality. He may have felt lonely, but history would tell us he was never alone, never alone, okay? 1 Samuel 22, verses 1 and 2 tells the story. It says this, David left Gath, and he escaped to the cave of Adola. Okay, that's where he's writing Psalm 142. When his brothers and his father's household heard about it, it says they went down to him, and they responded to him there. And all of those who were in distress or in debt or discontented gathered around him, and it just continues to say he became their commander. About 400 men, not counting the women, were with him. 400, okay? And I just need to say this. David wasn't lonely because nobody else was around that cared about him. There were lots of people around that cared about him, okay? David was lonely because he wasn't walking in the depth of those relationships that he longed for. He just wasn't walking in the depth. And listen, friends, for many, that's the world that we're living in. You hearing me? That's the world we're living in. Because loneliness is not the absence of faces. It's the absence of intimacy. It's the absence of being bonded together with others of a like cause. See what happens here? Like cause, they bond together. Listen, please, it's the absence of something that you can only find in real relationships. I believe it, okay? Didn't used to, I do now. I think that what David found that you can only find in intimacy is real relationships. You gotta get close. That's what this church needs to be. That's what this church needs to be, a people who are bonded together in real, not superficial, but real relationships relationships and ask anyone that's ever been in a serious small group of like believers because those people when you are in a cave those people are your light they are your light when loneliness and and all those other things are crowding in around you those people are your light i love our neighborhood group some of us are like family we've been together years now some who are literally neighborhood neighbors okay are more recent but they're quickly becoming family too and there's intimacy there's a bond okay and i love our neighborhood group and if you're not in one i encourage you to get in one if you need assistance call us we'll help you but here's another thing And I love that we live stream for those who can't physically or medically risk being here in person. I get it. And live stream isn't going anywhere for you folks. If you're wondering, is he going to say, no, we're keeping that. But here's the thing. And I can tell you, I can't tell you how many times when someone comes in here who's been live streaming and they come in here for in-person worship with the rest of the church family, they, they say the same thing every time. The same thing every time. It's nice to be able to worship at home, but it's not the same as being here in person they say it every time every time they say that it's so much better when we're here together do you hear do you know why that is church family because better is found in together and listen church family the good we once had i want you to hear me on this as a church okay and individually but as a church listen the good news that we once had is regained by being together i hope you're hearing me let me say that again That which was good is regained by being together. 
And it's right here in Psalm 142, because here's the reality. Because if I'm sitting, if I'm sitting here and I'm hearing David pour out his heart, I'm hearing him talk about the impossibility, I'm hearing him talking about being alone. Here, here's what I know. And you know it too, if you know the story. But what I know is I'm hearing all this, that all David can see in this moment is his cave and the good things that he once had that he no longer has, that he's lost, okay? But if you know the end of the story, then what you also know is for David. There's a palace coming. There's a palace coming, and there's a kingship coming, okay? I mean, we know that he's stuck in a cave, and he feels like he has no one, but what we know is is that if you just fast-forward this story just a few years down the road, he's going to find himself in the exact same cave with three of his closest friends that he's ever had in his whole life and a rich relationship with God his Father, and those three friends, they're going to respond to David's heart, and they're going to risk their lives for him, and he's going to literally be standing in the best moment that he's ever had because here's what we know. What we know about David is, is what David could only see, he could only, when he could only see the walls of his cave, God could see his future. And God could see the palace that he had in his future. And God could see the victory was just down the road, okay? And listen, friends, I, I, I don't know who among us might be in a cave today, but sometimes we just, we just walk through life together. And I think that we, we need to remind each other of this, to, you know, to one another, especially in our cave moments, okay? That the walls seem dark in a cave, that they may feel like they're closing in on you. And I think there just may be a lot of us in this cave right now because maybe we don't feel sad, but we don't feel good either, right? Because maybe we don't feel sad, but we don't, we don't feel good, which just may mean we are sad or lonely or kind of numb. And then listen, that's real, okay? But listen, listen, friend, you, can you see? There was, and there still is, this little light called a cross, right? And our friend Jesus' life was laid down on that cross, you know, and they took him down, and they wrapped him in clothes, and they literally took him, and they laid him in a fresh-cut cave. And for three days... There has never been a cave more dark and more sad. And listen, if you know how the story goes, for the rest of the story is that cave, the cave of defeat, the cave of sadness, the cave of darkness and loneliness became a cave of what? It became a cave of light. It became a cave of it's all good again. It became a cave of victory, you know? And, 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 uh, and so I'm just here, I guess, this morning to kind of remind you, church family, as a brother in the cause of the king, because some of you, you're in a cave of sadness. Okay, you're in the cave. In fact, I think that the cave in our present life and times is a huge cave. It's big. And a lot of folks, even church folk, are in that cave. And some of you didn't know it until you walked in the door today, right? You didn't know what it was, but now you do. Okay, but you are. You are in the midst of this cave of sadness, and that's the real truth, and you've been avoiding it, that truth, and you've been trying to run and hide from it. And I'm just here to tell you, remind you, some of you, that you're walking in sadness, bitterness, loneliness, and hopelessness, and I'm just here to remind you that the same power that resurrected the Son of God took life and put it in a dead body and brought it back to life again so that you and I have intimacy with the Father. That same power that rolled away the stone is available to you you today in your cave and he's just waiting for you to cry out and invite him in for he loves you and he wants to meet you right where you are in your cave and bring his light and his life and give you victory and all God's people said let's pray father we give thanks today that there's hope I give thanks today that I Lord, you've laid it on my heart that there's just so many that maybe not sad, but we don't feel good. We don't feel good, and we don't know if good's coming back. So I give thanks for the reminder today, Lord, that good with you always comes back. We just need to invite you in and invite each other in and form this bond and walk it together. Walk it together. I pray it would be so for the glory of Jesus. In his name I pray. Amen. I'm going to sing a song of response this morning. If you have ministry needs, you need to pray, you need to talk to someone, you need to make a decision for Christ, we invite you down. Just come on down and we'll help you. As we stand and sing this song of response, won't you come? Won't you come?